It's really great to have the opportunity to talk with you. I don't want to talk too long. I really want to have a conversation. And I'm extremely grateful for this opportunity, for the birdhouse, for you joining us, and for the Common Land Foundation and the Mustard Seed Trust, which make it possible for me to continue to do this work. One of the things that I think is, is very important is value. We have been valuing things higher than ecological function. We've even taken this further, and in the literature which is discussing, for instance, ecology or environmental issues or climate change, we've, we've begun to talk about something which I think is fundamentally false. We talk about ecosystem services. But in my research, I don't see any ecosystem services. I see functional or dysfunctional ecosystems. And what I've noticed is that most people talk about ecosystem services, but what they really need to be talking about is ecosystem function. Because the ecosystem services are derivatives. They're secondary systems that emerge from the primary systems. And if you focus on the secondary systems, it's very possible that you'll destroy the primary systems. So understanding that the oxygenated atmosphere, the freshwater system, the soil fertility, and the biodiversity, these are our fundamental primary aspects of life. And computers and airplanes and, and cameras and computers are derivatives that we've fashioned from the materials. And if we look at the difference of these, what is the difference between this? The first difference is that the ecological function is part of an eternal system. It's a question of time. It's about time. And the things are very short-term things. They're ephemeral. We make them, we love them, we think they're really useful, but they grow old and they deteriorate and they crumble. And they go into the trash heap. And if we're not careful and very carefully recycle them, they ooze toxic substances often into the air and the water and the soil. So we need to, we need to, to change our values. We need to understand that ecosystem function is the basis of life and things are just convenient, interesting things that we've fashioned, but they're ephemeral. And what we have to see then is that the outcomes which we're experiencing are not um, accidental. They're the result of the choices that we have made. So when we elevate things higher than life itself, we start to destroy the ecological function on the planet. If we elevate things higher than life itself, the eternal systems that have created and constantly filtered and continuously renewed the atmosphere, the fresh water system, the fertile soils, and the biodiversity, then we are creating a perverse incentive to degrade the systems we depend on for life. It's a huge mistake. And it's, it's connected to our economic thinking. We're imagining that we know what money is, that we know when we're transacting things, that this, this fiat currencies that we're using are real. 
But in this system, the GDP system, the global economic system, what we actually find is that the ecological function, the basis of life, is zero in the GDP economy. Can it be true that the atmosphere is worth worthless? That the soil fertility is nothing? That the biodiversity is just uh, about aesthetics? It's false. And all of our things are worth less than life. Life is eternal. We are stardust. And I think when we begin to consider these things, we go to a higher level of consciousness. When we believe in things, we're actually very constrained. And we're, we're operating often from self-interest and we're, off, um, we're operating from greed. And I think what we really need to be doing is, is acting from generosity and from knowledge. After spending most of the last three decades studying function and dysfunction in terrestrial ecosystems around the world, I've come to California. I've been trapped by the COVID virus and travel restrictions and the difficulty of moving about and the, the need to stay somewhat isolated from other people. And I've observed what's happening in California. And what I'm seeing is that the huge sequoias and redwood trees and the magnificent forests are the highest expression of evolution and evolutionary succession that exist anywhere on the planet. But tragically, they're only three to five percent of what they once were at the climax equilibrium. So there are remnants of these amazing systems. And then there's evidence that they were once much more magnificent. And what I saw was that when the moisture evaporates off the Pacific Ocean, it comes in and this forested system along the coastal forests is the first stage in processing this moisture. And the reason that this enormous climax equilibrium emerged here is because it's such a fertile and amazing place. And that moisture was absorbed not simply by the root systems and the consideration of moisture should not be simply rainfall because when that moisture comes in as clouds, as fog, then it's, it's absorbed by the leaf systems as much as it's coming up from the roots and it creates its own microclimate below the canopy and in these giant systems the, the, mic, the height of the canopy is over 100 meters so over 350 feet and that system then begins to process that water and absorb it into biological life and it's respirated and we are in symbiosis with the system and I've been all over the world and I notice that what's happening here in California is it's it's the climate's changing it's changing toward a Mediterranean climate but this is not what it should be if the system reaches its climax equilibrium, it's, it's more like a rainforest. 
And if we push it toward a Mediterranean climate, then it's going in the same direction as the Middle East, North Africa. And this is extremely dangerous, not only for California, but this system affects the entire continental United States, certainly everything uh, until the continental divide, but even beyond. And what I, what I found was that the climax equilibrium, the, the remnants that we can see of the climax equilibrium are only perhaps three to five percent of what they once were. And what's so terrifying to me about that is that the water is in the biomass. The water isn't just in the rivers and the lakes. It's in the biomass and those huge trees that, that are over 350 feet tall. They're 70% water at least. And this, if, if, if we're only three to 5% of the climax equilibrium, that means we're not storing the water and that already 95 to 97% of that water has been lost. And the physics changes when you alter the earth systems and the bio biological systems means that basic functions like physics or gravity begin to take over. So the physics changes are when the solar radiation directly hits the surface of the earth. The temperature is elevated by enormous amounts, 10, 15, 20 degrees centigrade. I found 45 degrees centigrade changes, but that's an extreme system. And gravity takes over, so instead of having vast amounts of organic material and the exudates from bacteria and fungal and insects and holding the soil together, you get erosion. So what happens in those situations? Drought, flooding, mudslides, giant wildfires. So basically we're seeing it play out, but it plays out over a different time frame than a single lifetime. Human impacts, the major human impacts in this biome are from only less than 200 years, really. So if you compare it to the Middle East, the destruction began 12,000 years ago. But here, native indigenous peoples cared for and tended these forests for 15,000 years at least. So it wasn't an accident when colonial settlers came here and looked at the land and, and found it magnificent. It was not only that that was the evolutionary climax, that's true, but it was the, re, the understanding that the indigenous people had that all life was sacred, that it wasn't available for human beings to just take whatever they wanted. And strangely, that's very close to the Judeo-Christian Islamic uh, cosmology, which says that human beings emerged in paradise, but then they sinned. And in, in he, here, in California, the indigenous people worshiped 
nature. And so they didn't destroy it. But then, when we switched our economy to believe in materialism, we built up huge amounts of material things, but we also destroyed the natural systems. So, what, what I've been looking at is all the many problems that I'm seeing. I'm seeing enormous material accumulation to some people here. They're billionaires, a billionaire class. And then there are millions of people who are failing in this existing economy. And it's very hard for me to appreciate and understand how to enjoy privilege if I have to step over someone or see someone who's miserable in the street. And it creates this kind of tension. So I've been thinking about function and dysfunction for a very long time. And I'm seeing a, a great deal of dysfunction and I'm seeing the results of that dysfunction here. And I'm also seeing th the height of functionality, but it's only a remnant of three to five percent of its potential. So when we understand that everything is interrelated, that there is no possibility that you can consider problems individually, the only way to solve the problems that we're facing is by linking them all together because they're all part of, of our greater problems. So mainly for a long time I've been studying about biodiversity and biomass and soil fertility and micro, the relationships between microbiology and biology, other parts of biology, plant biology. But I look here in California and I see not only massive disruptions to, for instance, the hydrological cycle or the biodiversity loss or the soil fertility, toxicity, some other things, different, different dysfunctions emerging. But I'm seeing that there are people who are hungry. There are people that are homeless. There, there are many, many unemployed people. And then there are many people who are underemployed, who are employed more like indentured servants who just keep working. They work harder than anybody else and they get less than anybody else. Now that's a clue too. Um, and what I've seen in studying ecology tells me, and, and also in permaculture, I really wasn't involved in permaculture. I was studying ecology, but then the permaculture world kind of got into my <laughs> into my frame of of study, and I thought, oh, these are really interesting. And and in permaculture, they have something called stacking functions, and these stacking functions are about symbiosis. They're about multi-dimensional symbiotic systems. And I started to see that that's really what we need to do to understand and to, to use in order to design the changes that we'll need to, to make in order to have functional systems. And so, 
I think it's also partly the COVID and partly the collapse of, of the economic system because of the closures. And there's also something about the political system which is seriously uh, dysfunctional. So I started wondering, how can we deal with this? What can we do? When I see people who are hungry, when I see people who are homeless, when I see people who are unemployed and they don't know what they're doing, or I even see people who are employed, but their work is kind of meaningless. And I mean, this can go very high. You could be very highly paid to do something that's not really needed. And I realized that what's, mean, what's missing is meaning. So back to considering function and dysfunction in terrestrial ecosystems. First of all, I think that it's critical to restore the hydrological cycle in California. Since this moisture coming off the Pacific Ocean and the huge potential, that's what we see with the climax equilibrium is the potential, that this is huge. This is, this is what's necessary and that has to be the central intention for human civilization. But so many things are, are stopping us from focusing on exactly what we need to do. So we need, the, in, in, besides stacking functions, there's something else that I've been learning, which is about evolutionary succession. That you really can't jump too far ahead. You have to realize that functionality is coming in stages. Quite a long time ago, cell division began. And when cell division began, these were very simple organisms, and they were the first organisms, and they, their life, they lived and died and lived and died very rapidly. And now, everywhere you go in the world, you find bacteria. But you don't only find bacteria, you find everything. You find, find this enormous biodiversity. And so this biodiversity, the differentiation and speciation, leads to infinite potential variety in genetics. This is quite an extraordinary outcome, but it depends on those earliest simple organisms because they're all interconnected. And that's what our DNA is because we're, we're, we're not only related to all other human beings, we're related to all other living things on the earth. And what I've been thinking about now that I've been in California and especially talking with the birdhouse and with the other camps that are setting up in California is that this is an enormous task, but it's a task which we can do with joy and which brings us meaning and takes away a lot of the confusion that we have. And it starts with understanding we're going to have to deal with all these layers. We can't just go and restore the forests. We can't plant trees only. We have to restore human health and human function. We have to heal. So I started thinking about what's happening. I know that there's going to be more and more unemployment, more and more homelessness more and more hunger, it's already here. And there are people who don't have, who don't have health care and who are ill. And we need to, we need to figure this out. But in, in the concept of succession, I think the first one is probably hunger. <laughs> and so we better feed the hungry. If we feed the hungry, then they'll be in a position to do something different. They won't be a drain on human civilization and on society. 
And so how can we do that? I thought we, sh we, we should come together and we should build central kitchens. And we've been looking at that uh, and it's, it's definitely possible. And we should, we should then connect the, the central kitchens to the producers of organic and biodynamic food so that we have the highest nutrient density. And when we do that, we can start to influence the, the type of agriculture that's going on because we have a lot of industrial agriculture which is, which is, which is destroying the basic natural fertility of the earth. It's creating nitrate layers, salt layers in the soils. It's compacting the soils. It's leaving persistent organic pollutants which are carcinogenic. It's going into the water. It's terrible. Zero is the only allowable amount of toxic substances in our food. If we come together and we build central kitchens, then we can feed all the people. And at the same time, we can improve the agricultural system by collaborating with people who want to do regenerative agriculture. And I started thinking about the other successional things. I was thinking about building central kitchens and I realized in order to build central kitchens you need to have a lot of tools and equipment together to build kitchens so we could make creator spaces where we have all the tools necessary for metalworking and mechanics and woodworking and we can go further and have craft and and we can prepare our own ceramics and we can have industrial sewing. And I was thinking about, well, some of the homeless people that I've seen in Hollywood and in other parts of California, they really need a shower. So we could use those creator spaces to make showers and saunas. Saunas use less water. We can also make gray water <laughs> recycling systems for all the water, too. And then I thought, well, we, we should have laundries where the homeless people can do their laundry. And then gradually as, as people who, you know, they're different. I noticed also that there are different kinds of homeless people. There are homeless people with serious psychological problems or extreme addiction issues, substance abuse issues. And then there are, there are homeless who just are underemployed and are paid badly. And they're the hardest working people anywhere. Well, gradually, I think we could, when people are in a community, they're well-dressed, they, they can take a shower and, and a sauna when they need it, and they have really good organic and biodynamic food they're in much better shape. So as soon as we get to the point where we're feeding the people, they're going to be feeding others because they're going to realize that they've been empowered and they're going to be working in the creator spaces and they're going to be recycling the, the gray water systems and they're going to be building nursery systems to grow plants and food and they're going to be able to go out and create and enlarge ecosystem restoration camps. And in doing that, they're going to be able to replant the forests which have been destroyed. And that these communities could be joyous and these communities could be wonderful places for healing for individuals and healing for the planet. That's where I want to be. And I hope that that's where we all want to be. So what I've seen is that there are these feedback loops. And 
once we start doing these things, they create a positive, uh, a, a, a virtuous circle, and they replace the 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 sort of cycle of of collapse that we're experiencing. And the fact is, we know how to restore large-scale degraded ecosystems. We know how to lower surface temperatures on the planet to reduce human impact on climate changes. We know how to restore hydrology. We know how to restore biodiversity. And these are more valuable than buying and selling things and pretending that material things are what protect us. What protects us and what gives us life is the oxygenated atmosphere, the hydrological cycle, the soil fertility, and the biodiversity. So if we put this back, if we make this right, then we change the course of human history. And of course this can't only be done in California, but what's interesting is when we talk about this in any other part of the world, the people also respond. So now there are, four years ago we started talking about, let's just do this. Let's stop asking for permission from the United Nations or the governments or something. What they represent us. So if we choose, and they have created some kind of bureaucratic inertia that makes it impossible to do anything, then why don't we just do it? And when we do it, we're going to change ourselves, we're going to change the ecology, and in, in all in positive ways, and we can change the economy because we can prove very rapidly that ecological function is more valuable than things. Once we get to the point where we understand that ecological function is the basis of life and is vastly more valuable than material things, then it will become the basis of our economy. And that economy will be much bigger than the material economy and that economy will be much more fairly distributed among all life. It's in benefit of every living thing, not just human beings. And we can simplify. We don't need so much stuff. We need functional ecosystems. We need love, time, health. Those are the things that we need. And I think we're at the point where this is now possible. Certainly in my own research I've seen we can restore large-scale degraded ecosystems and through the efforts of ordinary people without much in the way. I mean we need some knowledge but we don't need a lot of new machines and equipment and stuff. We need people to understand this. It's consciousness. The landscape reflects our consciousness. So I'm really looking forward to having a deep conversation about what we could do to revitalize California, the United States, North America, the Earth, and we can do this in an ecological way, we can do this in a moral way, and we can do this in a purposeful and meaningful way which makes our lives uh, completely uh, understandable.